Good evening and welcome everybody to the 46th uh, Buckingham Talk in the Great Mind Great Lives series and today is the 11th of September 2020 and appropriately we have a talk about what happened on that day 19 years ago a day that uh, many of us uh, knew at the time would be a defining day of uh, the world history and in our own lives uh, and I, I could not believe my luck our luck when I invited somebody who was at the very heart of the Prime Minister's team uh, on that day Angie Hunter whether she'd be willing to share her thoughts about what happened on that day uh, Tony Blair very close already to the new President Bush um, and uh, a man who uh, was at the very very heart uh, of what was uh, happening perhaps the second most influential figure uh, certainly in the western world at the time so uh, it was a great thrill when Angie Hunter said she'd be very happy to uh, talk and thank you Angie very very much indeed before handing you over to her can I just say a particular welcome to all who are new to the series uh, of talks you can catch up on the 45 that have happened and the 25 that will be to, to, to come um, uh, by just clicking uh, onto the series and do have uh, questions uh, we already have one question in uh, slightly uh, revealingly saying what a wonderful talk that was bit of a giveaway uh, there uh, do have questions and the shorter they are uh, the better and if you've got your name uh, that's very good too that's all um, Angie Hunter uh, who as everybody knows was at the heart of the Tony Blair team uh, from the moment that she became leader of the Labour Party in 1994 and before um, Thank you for joining us tonight, Angie, and uh, tell us, please, about the 11th of September 2001, the day on which I recall the weather was rather beautiful. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Anthony, and indeed for inviting me. Um, I have to say, it's slightly nerve-wracking um, doing a viral talk. I haven't done one before, and I have done loads of talks, of course, I always like to see my audience, so I'm I'm looking at, at myself basically, which is uh, uh, not brilliant. Anyway, uh, people of my age and Anthony's age um, will remember exactly where they were when President Kennedy was shot in 1963. Um, a lot of you will, that are listening to this will not um, remember that. Some of you might remember where you were on 9-11, uh, not 9-11, on uh, the 29th of July, uh, 1997, when um, uh, uh, Princess Diana was killed, 31st of August, I beg your pardon, when Princess Diana was killed in Paris. And I think a lot of people remember where they were then. Um, some of you will remember where you were on 9-11. And for those that can't remember because you're too young, I hope you don't mind if I just fill you in with a little bit of what was happening in the period before, the period basically 1989 to 2001. And there were three things to, to know about that period. 1989, the uh, wall came down um, in, in, in Berlin, the Berlin Wall. Um, my lifetime had been um, dominated by the Cold War, the uh, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. That, uh, and the wall came down, and it was the triumph of liberal democracy. We'd beaten fascism, now we'd beaten communism, and it was sort of the new established world order of liberal democracy. So that is the background. Number two, in the place of that that foreign foreign policy, the, the, the Cold War, came a growing concern with what was happening with the failed and failing nations, uh, uh, places like Libya, uh, Afghanistan, um, where the power vacuums were being filled by extremists um, who, if they had weapons, might, might misuse them. Um, and Tony had, had been very concerned about this. Um, We'd had our own incident here, terrorist incident, Lockerbie. There'd actually been an attack on the World Trade Center in 1993 in the US. There was the US Embassy in Tanzania. There were these 
terrorist attacks, uh, which we were very aware of. And we were aware that Osama bin Laden was involved in, um, in this area. I think in, it was in um, uh, Tanzania. Um, he'd been sort of seen around, a bit more active, you know, in the months before. Uh, Tony had read the Quran that summer on holiday and he was very taken with it and the desirability of martyrdom, you know, was so striking. And then thirdly, the thing to remember about that period was the closeness between the US and the UK. Um, right from the actual war, Churchill and FDR, then you had Thatcher and Reagan, you had Major and um, Bush Senior, the first Iraq war, you had Tony, I hope it's okay if I refer to him as Tony, is that all right, Anthony? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Tony um, of course. Um, and Bill Clinton, you know, they had an incredibly close relationship. Um, so that, that, that's the backdrop for you. Uh, just one other thing to say that in 1999, in June, Tony had made a speech at the Economic Club in Chicago, at the end of the Kosovo War. It's basically when he set out his doctrine of um, liberal interventionism, which is that military inter interventionism in another country, even if it's not in your national interest, can be justified on the grounds of the despotic nature of the regime and the humanitarian distress being caused. So that's your backdrop. So I'm going to take you now to this very day 19 years ago. Um, a day very like today has been actually, you know, beautiful blue sky. Um, nine weeks before we had just won our, our second historic uh, term, there'd been a general election. Uh, I, we had a majority of 167. George Bush had won in 2000 um, and we were both, you know, knuckling down with domestic policy agenda and there wasn't heightened terrorism. So we had the summer break. And at the end of the summer break, as anyone involved in politics knows, it's the start of the new term and it starts with conferences. And first of all, there's the trade union conference, then the Lib Dems, then Labour, then the Conservatives. And that takes you up to sort of middle of October and then Parliament re returns and the whole um, uh, parliamentary year begins. So we were in that period, um, we were limbering up the speeches, uh, UC speech and the conference speech. I was actually in this building where I am now, my house in the country in Sussex um, on the morning because I was traveling really early down to Brighton where the trades union conference was being held. And that was my job. I was, my, my, my title was director of government relations, but I basically used to sort of go ahead and just be with Tony um, and just make sure he was doing the right thing and seeing the right people and then everything worked. But, you know, everything was just working seamlessly. So I went down ahead uh, that morning. I remember listening to the day programme, John Edmonds, who was the GMB union leader, put up posters saying that, that um, we were uh, are going to abolish the NHS. So I went down ahead. I did my, my um, chats around, checked with the unions, that everything was OK, checked when Tony was going to be speaking spoke to the journalists, spoke to my friends and colleagues, linked up with the number 10 trade union team. And then I went back to the hotel and it was the Grand Hotel, which is where Tony was, was going to be just before his speech. And we were in the suite. So I went up to the suite and I checked it all out. And you have to remember in those days, there were no communications. You know, like nowadays, everybody's like this all the time. We had sort of Nokia phones and pages, but we were just moving into being able to text. It was just that in, during that election, we learned how to text. So it was not the communications that we have now. And, that, and everywhere the prime minister goes, a, a communications team has to go down and set up all communications for him. Phones, fax machines, uh, uh, in those days, fax machines, you know, typing the whole thing and a little mini number 10 has to be set up. So I went down, spoke to all of the, the people involved in that, or colleagues and friends, I spoke to the special branch, and then I went to wait for Tony arriving outside the hotel. And this was at about 12.40, I guess. And 
I will, you know, for his arrival. And it's always the, you know, the, the arrival scene that all the journalists want to take. And it was the leading news, Tony addressing the TUC speech. So they were all there. And I remember there's this, there's this wonderful guy called Stuart Holmes, who, who uh, people will know if they, are, if they have attended conferences. He's a sort of massive anti-smoking fanatic. And he used to just always stand outside whatever entrance the prime minister or whoever it was, was going into. He had a sort of uncanny knack of knowing when he was arriving and where. And he dressed up as a cigarette. That was his outfit. So he's standing there beside me dressed as a cigarette. And he was shouting, Tony Blair, you don't care. Tony Blair, you don't care. And then Tony sweeps up. I say to the journalist, sorry, guys, you know, he's not going to, to uh, say anything today. And up into the suite. And he was slightly late and always and frazzled, as he often was before big speeches. You know, Tony used to work on his speeches right up to the, to the last moment. So we were up in his suite. There was Alistair Campbell, his press secretary, and myself. And it was a suite on two floors. There was sort of the bedroom sort of that he made into his office and then a spiral staircase. And then underneath small room where we were all gathered, that's where the Downing Street office was, the special branch offices, press offices, you know, other people involved in the in the whole thing. And I was up there with Tony uh, and Alistair, Alistair and Tony working on the street. I was getting messages from people over the PUC saying, what's going on? What time is he arriving? So, you know, there was another bid for an interview, all that sort of thing. And Godric, who was Alistair Campbell's deputy, came up, it's about 10 to 2, and we were due to leave about quarter past two for Tony speaking at half two. And he said, he motioned to us, he said, look, you better come down. So we went downstairs. And Matt, would you show the first clip? This is what we watched on the television, right? I mean, it's pretty shocking. Can, uh, can I just, is... Angie, can I just say there that um, we're going to show some more uh, clips and they are quite upsetting, as Angie is saying. And so uh, if you are likely to be upset by it, um, don't uh, watch the screen, please, while they are uh, showing. And also, if you're upset by what Angie is saying, again, uh, best not to listen. Angie, back to you. OK. Um, so the minute we saw that, Alistair and I just dashed upstairs and said, it was an accident, by the way, it was it was being, that's what the news was, this terrible accident. They, they, they thought it was a small plane, a private plane that had sort of just got lost or and had, had a technical failure and had crashed into the twin towers. So we went upstairs and Alistair said, Tony, you're going to have to say something at the beginning of your speech, you know, about this terrible accident, New York and, you know, your your, you know, your sympathy to the families, etc. And Tony said, OK, OK. Um, and he said, Angie, go back down and watch it. And keep your eye on it. And Alistair stayed with him. And, and just to sort of an aside, at this time, I haven't got a clip of this, but Bush and, uh, was, was in a school. And he had been told as he went into the, the he was doing reading with children. And as he went in, he was told about the accident as well. There's been this accident. So I went back downstairs and I'm sitting and to watch to monitor the news. And the next clip is quite quite it's not long, long, but it's this is what we were watching, right? This is what exactly what was happening. And we were watching it on CBS News, obviously on BBC or Sky, but we had no footage. You know, we were using the American footage. So Matt, please clip two. And Teresa Renault is with us right now. Ms. Renault, good morning. Good morning. How this are is, you? This is Brian Gumbel. I'm down on uh, 59th and 5th. Where are you? I am in Chelsea, and we are at, at 8th and 16th. We are the tallest building in the area, and we my window faces south 
Uh, so it looks directly onto the World Trade Center. And I would say, you know, approximately 10 minutes ago, there was a major explosion from probably, uh, it looks like about the 80th floor. It looks like it's affected probably four to eight floors. Uh, major flames are coming out of the, let's see, the north side and also the east side of the building, yes. And it was very loud explosion followed by flames. And it looks like the building is still on fire on the inside. Um, which building are we talking about? The one that's westernmost? Um, let's see. Yes, sir. Did you hear the explosion oh, from yes. your position? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we we heard it and and because I was just like standing there pretty much looking out the window. I didn't see what caused it or if there was an impact. So you have no idea right, right oh, now? Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> Right. Oh, oh my gosh, another plane has just hit, it hit another building, oh. flew right into the middle of it, explosion. Oh my God, it's right in the middle of the building. This one into the east tower. Yes, yes, right in the middle of the building. It, and right now, that, yes, that was definitely looked like it was on purpose. You saw a yes, plane? Yes, I just saw a plane go into the building. Why do you say that was definitely on purpose? It, because it just it just flew straight into it. It looks like it's about, uh, I would say, 15 floors lower than the first building. And there is now flames coming out of that building as well. They're both completely on fire. Now, Teresa, hang on with us one second. We're going uh, to re-rack the tape of when we were talking to you to see if we can tell. Okay. Um, we can't see anything. We can't see a second plane in the picture. There we see the explosion. Right. Um, I actually, you could see the second plane in that last bit. He hadn't spotted it, but I, you may have seen it. You know, it was coming in from the other side. So we were, you, you can imagine the shock for us as well. Our, our special branch, all our fantastic security guys were up off their seats within you know, like jack in the box, because like her, that woman that that was doing the the, the 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 voice there, knew we knew immediately it wasn't an accident. This anymore, you know, this was two minutes past two. It had happened, and our first one was at one forty six. So this was not an accident. Uh, Kate Garvey, who was there, she ran upstairs and said, you know. Have you seen? Have you seen? And they were actually watching it. Um, I was immediately talking with the special branch. You know, he said, you have to go into sort of emergency lockdown mode, working out, you know, what was going on, where, what, what Tony would do. I dashed upstairs. As I say, you know, communications were terrible. So I was having my phone was being used, Kate's, others for people to phone in. And Tony immediately spoke to Jonathan Powell, our chief of staff from Downing Street. He spoke to Jack Straw, our Foreign Secretary, Jeff Hoon, our Defence Secretary, uh, David Blunkett, our Home Secretary, um, immediately touching base with them, you know, let me know what's going on. Immediately with the with the permanent, with the Cabinet Secretary, Rob, uh, not Robin Butler, who was it then? Anthony <laughs> Richard, of course, yeah. Um, and just, and fixing up, up, you know, meetings from when we got back. I was frantically speaking to the people at the TUC, saying, obviously, you know, we can't do the speech now, but we'll come over. Special branch went and checked to see whether there was an underground tunnel that you could go from the Grand Hotel to the conference centre, which we did go through. And we sort of emerged, actually, on the street, not in the conference centre, you know. And I remember sort of coming to sort of run, they wanted us to sort of run down, because we had no idea at that mo moment whether we were going to be under attack. Um, I think as we were leaving, actually, the, the, the hotel, that's when we heard about the other two things that had happened. But the, the, a, a plane had crashed into the Pentagon and a, a, a plane that had been on its way to the White House had been downed by the passengers on board and it had crashed into a field. Um, uh, airspace was closed in America. You know, it was an absolute emergency. I think that was even before we left to go and make the speech. So we, we, we go in and Tony makes a speech. And again, this is quite a long clip. But I think it's quite important because it does set out where he was right from the beginning. And remember, this was about 
half an hour max after that second hit. Oh, the other thing that to remember about this, there is Bush, right, in his school in Florida. And there's a great clip of this. I don't, I, I'm not going to show it now, but you should look it up. And he's sitting there and Andy Carr, his chief of staff, comes in and just whispers in his ear. And, he's, and he actually says, um, a second plane has gone into the second tower. America is under attack, sir, is what he says. I mean, you know, it is a, it's just, an ex, just extraordinary. So, um, so we went over to TC and we're there and Tony goes on to make his speech. And Matt, if you could play that next clip, please. Thank you. In the light of uh, that information, I now invite the Prime Minister to make a statement to the Congress. Bill Congress, as Bill has just informed you, there have been the most uh, terrible, shocking events taking place in the United States of America within the last hour or so, including two hijacked planes being flown deliberately into the World Trade Center. I'm afraid we can only imagine the terror and the carnage there, and the many, many innocent people that will have lost their lives. I know that you would want to join with me in sending the deepest condolences to President Bush and to the American people on behalf of the British people at these terrible events. This mass terrorism is the new evil in our world today. It is perpetrated by fanatics who are utterly indifferent to the sanctity of human life. And we, the democracies of this world, are going to have to come together to fight it together and eradicate this evil completely from our world. Delegates, I hope you will understand that I don't think it's appropriate to carry on the speech that I was going to give to you today. I know I have issued copies of the speech. We will make sure that all delegates get copies of the speech, but I think it inappropriate to give that speech now here. I will obviously want to carry on the discussions that we've had about the issues that concern us. I will now return to, to London. And once again, I thank you for your indulgence here. I'm very, very sorry it has turned out the way that it has. But I know that, as I say, you would want to join with me in offering our deepest sympathy to the American people and our absolute shock and outrage at what has happened. So that must have been about half past three. Um, we walked back to the suite at the Grand. We went back upstairs. Um, and our special branch had decided that we must not travel back in the car because we would be too identified going up the M23, you know, just in case there were people trying to do us damage. Um, we would be spotted from the air. Was that a serious possibility, Angie? Well, you did, no one knew, Anthony. This is, this is literally, you know, minutes, no one knew quite, this is exactly the same thing was happening in Paris and Berlin. You know, people in cities, Hey, had, you know, people did not know what was going to be happening in their own countries. You know, was this going to be an attack, you know, worldwide? Um, so we get back to the hotel and Tony um, sets up uh, for our, uh, and while they're deciding about our transport and we, it was deciding we would be, we would go in the, a train. We would sort of go incognito as possible to the station and go up on the train to London from Brighton. And uh, we set up uh, the, uh, a COBRA meeting. And for those who think, you know, you'll have heard COBRA meetings because our current prime minister, as you know, is quite famous for not having attended them 
uh, uh, prior to the to the COVID lockdown. Um, he, it, but COBRA, it actually it, it it's an acronym for C C O B R, which is the Cabinet Office Briefing Room, which is actually a room downstairs under the Cabinet Office Building, which is a building attached to Downing Street, a big conference room in the basement. Um, and to, you know, uh, uh, obviously, all the, the the cabinet secretaries that were that important there were going to be there. But also the head of MI5, Stephen Lander, the head of uh, MI6, Richard Dearlove, the Joint Intelligence Committee chair, that was Sir John Scarlett. Um, all these, you know, people, the head of the de Department of Transport, the uh, Met Police Commissioner, all these people had to be brought into this room. Um, so we were fixing that up. Then we make the dash to the station. We get on the train, and it was just—it was very odd on the train. It was a slight blip spirit because all the journal journalists were all scrambling back to London as well. Communications were absolutely hopeless. We were getting a lot of our information from the journalists who were getting calls from their news desk. Um, and I can remember sitting with you know with Tony near Tony, and we were looking out the window, and I remember him saying it's everything's changed you know everything the world has changed and i remember sitting there thinking that too the sussex countrysides were rolling by and thinking god you know this is totally cataclysmic and will change our world i do remember thinking that and i was obviously i'm a mom i was frantic I'm trying to get hold of my kids but my husband my children were teenagers. I managed to track my daughter down. Um, uh, she went home to watch it on television. My son was in Greece, so I wasn't able to get hold of him at that mo moment. Um, but you do sort of worry about your close people when you're in when something like that happens. So we're back into Downing Street. I don't know about six-ish, and straight into his room, where he's immediately briefed by the, the, all the security guys. I was telling you about MI5, MI6. Uh, John Scarlett, I think it was, or was one of them said, absolutely in the room straight away. I, I, I think it's Osama bin Laden that 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 um, is behind this because it's so sophisticated, and only he's got the sophistication to organise something uh, like this. Um, so we go down to the Cobra meeting, and uh, our airspace over London has been closed. There's heightened security in Canary Wharf. I remember thinking of my friends out in Canary Wharf, what if they attacked them there? You, there was a heightened security at all the embassies around the world, people reporting in. Jack Straw was saying he was, was a, uh, organising a council, of, uh, European Council on this. Um, uh, the police commissioner was talking about, you know, in, in ensuring that, you know, there was, you know, massive police presence. Um, and then we went back to work on Tony's um, statement that he would have to make that evening. Um, Bush had been taken, or he gets, if anything like this happens in America, the, 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 he immediately has to go into, what do they call it, bunk, you know, into a sort of bunker somewhere, military bunker. He, he was desperate to get back to Washington, actually, but the, his secret service wouldn't let him. Because the protocol there, if something like this has happened, he's got to be taken to a place of safety. And no one could get hold of him. Um, Tony did speak, I think, but yeah, he did. That evening, before he made his speech, he spoke to um, uh, uh, President Chirac in France, um, uh, Schroeder in Germany, Prime Minister Jospin in France as well. He spoke to Putin. You know, he was immediately speaking, and there was an immediate solidarity. You know, everybody was as totally shocked and uh, uh, locked together, standing together on this. So we went and worked on the speech, or he he actually worked on the speech. These were entirely his words. Um, a few contributions, I suspect, from others, but he he you know, sat down and did it. Uh, so our final clip, um, please, is, oh no, I'll tell you what I've forgotten to show. And I think you need to see this, actually is it was we watched it when we came back from the conference and before we went on the train just that fourth clip um if you don't mind matt the north 
I wanted to show you that just to, to just let you know the just absolute shocking nature of this. But and they were also, you know, we we also watched the Pentagon collapsing, the both towers collapsing. I mean, it was just the most incredible thing to be happening. Um, I mean, this is this is the Twin Towers. This was the sort of uh, the symbol of American power and dominance. But also, it's, it was it was a, a symbol of our uh, participation in the new global world that we were in. You know, the globalization, the modern the modern way we were doing things. We were participating in it, and that the twin towers they were the most um, um, uh, iconic, diverse. I think diverse are workplaces, you can imagine. That's the word, diverse, with people from all races, all nations, all faiths, um, represents, you know, 90 countries. These were people involved in finance and banking. Uh, these were just people, you know, at, at their place of work. So it was a sort of, it was a symbol of our new world being just, crashed to the ground. So I, I just wanted you to see that. So if we can now go, um, Matt, uh, to uh, the evening, when uh, this is the evening, um, Tony is making his speech. Mass terrorism. Statements. The new evil in our world. The people who perpetrate it have no regard whatever for the sanctity or value of human life. And we, the democracies of the world, must come together to defeat it and eradicate it. This is not a battle between the United States of America and terrorism, but between the free and democratic world and terrorism. We therefore here in Britain stand shoulder to shoulder with our American friends in this hour of tragedy. And we, like them, will not rest until this evil is driven from our world. I mean, these were the same points that he was making at the TUC. You know, firstly, we stand together. We stand together in this. And uh, secondly, this is the new evil. This Islamic fundamentalism. So he called it out straight at the beginning. Um, we all went home, obviously, that evening, shell shock. Uh, spoke to our families. Uh, so I think everybody wanted to, that's what you want to do at times like that, reconnect. Obviously, we had to have phone calls during the night as well about what was happening. Um, in the morning, obviously, very relieved that there had been no further attacks anywhere else uh, in the world. Um, and, and we were all safe in this country. Um, the newspapers that met the next day it was at war. It was just this immediate recognition that 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 we we were either at war, we were at war. Um, and there was this absolute sense. And I, 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 I hope you share it with me, the people that are watching this, that this was something so terrible that we couldn't let this pass. You know, we had to have some response to this. You know, we had, this This was too big a thing to not have a, a proper response to. Um, the very next day, I remember we spent the whole day on it. Obviously, in fact, every day after that, uh, we were on it. Um, we wanted as, as much information as possible about what we thought Bush might, what his inclination would be. Um, we, we thought he would be after, he would go, to Afghanistan, because that's where Osama bin Laden was. That is where the Taliban um, were in power. Um, we had a, I think one of the security guys that day said that there'd been a sighting of 
Osama two or three days before in Kandahar. Um, so that is where they were going to concentrate their, their efforts. We didn't know at that time, you know, what or when and what his reaction would be. Um, there was another uh, COBRA meeting, you know, we had them every day after that about whether you keep the no fly zones in place and whether to lift them or not. And uh, uh, Bank of England came in, I remember. There was representative there one time, you know, about well, steadying the markets, the supply of oil was being monitored. Uh, Tessa Jal was appointed as um, the minister for the book for the families that had been involved in, in this. And sometime during that first day, we got a message that uh, President Bush wanted to talk to Tony. And then, uh, I mean, I wasn't there at that, that conversation. But he said afterwards, I mean, I, I, I tend not to speak about things that I wasn't actually personally involved in or overheard myself. But obviously I was in there afterwards and did know what the gist of the conversation. But he was extremely calm. Uh, George Bush, um, very measured. Tony was very impressed. Um, he really listened to what Tony was saying. Tony immediately said, we've got to form a coalition against these uh, uh, extremists, a, 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 a global alliance. That is what we need to do. Um, he already obviously picked up from all the people he'd been speaking to that, you know, people would be signed up, you know, for that. Um, I, 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 world leaders, we're all profoundly shocked by this and all felt the, 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 the need to, to do something very serious about it. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, George Bush asked Tony to write a note about it. Tony did, and he sort of set out, again, the doctrine of a liberal, you know, in interventionism, obviously, but also in this case, more so. Um, he thought that the best uh, thing for Bush to do would be to um, uh, uh, offer an ultimatum to the Taliban. And, and there were six points in this ultimatum. I mean, they, I mean, this wasn't formed at this time. This is just what you, even that night, Tony's note, it was beginning to have the, the kernel of this, an ultimatum to the Taliban. At six points, I remember two of them, one was hand him over, hand over Osama bin Laden. And the other one was um, dismantle your your training camp. Um, so then the next few days, Tony made a speech to, in the House of Commons, a statement about it the next day. Uh, again, uh, everybody was extremely supportive in the House of Commons. He had a very good meeting with them. Um, I think it was Ian Duncan Smith, wasn't it then, Anthony? Um, and it became clear that we yes, would have yes. to get... Yeah, we, we would have to get motoring. I mean, this was what Tony was going, was wanting to do. We are, we, he was the one that wanted to be central in building up the alliance, you know, in building up people that were going to be in favor of doing something. Um, and that was my job, uh, working obviously with all of our foreign uh, office colleagues, but to fix up this world tour, to go and, and get, um, uh, uh, the support of our allies in this. And we, we did a couple of jaunts. We went to Germany and um, day trips. Uh, we went to Berlin, we went to Paris. Um, and our first big trip was on the 19th of September when we went to the US because it was a memorial service at, um, in New York, uh, the, the, the governors, um, and it was a memorial service for our British victims. Um, I mean, there were 67 uh, British people killed, uh, all, a lot of them working in the Twin Towers in their, you know, in the financial sector, lawyers, uh, but also I remember one nurse, British nurse, who was there visiting her brother for the day. I mean, it was a tragic stories and somebody was actually on the plane that was taken down by the passengers. That crashed in Pennsylvania. Um, and so, you know, we, there were 67 British deaths. There were 2,974 deaths altogether. So, you know that too. So, off we went to New York. Um, we, we went to the church service. There was terrible traffic that day. I remember it was terrible weather. 
um, it was awful at the at the at the um more at the at this service uh meeting the families you know Tony having to meet the families um I mean, it's just a, a sort of absolute grief and shock I I think mean, Christopher Mayer he read out a, a message from this queen saying grief is the price we pay for love I remember that um and then we we then we had to go down to Washington. Sorry, Anthony, I'm nearly there. Then we had to go down to Washington. We had to go down to Washington to meet President Bush. Um, and I remember Tony just frantic on the plane because we were so late. He couldn't believe that we'd been so stupid. You know what were you doing? You know it's all, obviously all my fault. Um, to keep the president waiting. Um, and when we got to the White House, um, I was. We were all there. Bush and he went off and talked. We had dinner. I remember being at the dinner, like a normal dinner with all the all the aides and the other officials. And Tony and Bush was at the dinner. He, he said something that Tony would never do, just have a sort of dinner before making a major speech. George Bush was going to address the two houses of of uh, uh, at, the, at Congress, the two houses. It was a joint. Um, a dress he was doing, and we all went there. And I remember, I'd never been in the, that room before where they had what's it called, Anthony, the Senate room. Yes, it, it was the joint enormous room, and they were all there. And to, I sat in the you know in the balcony bits, but opposite mm. Tony because Tony was sitting in the balcony bit next to next to Laura Bush, um, and I was sitting watching him and. You know, they, it was so supportive, you know, everybody kept standing up and clapping President Bush. And I remember Tony, I just remember watching him sort of bobbing up and down, you know, I mean, you know, making sure that he was, you know, clapping at the right bit. Um, it was a good speech. And he did say, you know, our great, our great friend, and he pointed to Tony. And I remember the, our foreign office uh, advisors were extremely anxious that we didn't, he didn't do that speech because they thought it would just sort of, you know, he was Bush's poodle, but Tony felt right at the beginning. Of course, you know, of course, I'm going to be there. Um, um, yeah, and then we went straight from there. We flew from there to Brussels uh, for an emergency European Council, um, and then on the second of October we had the Labour Party conference. Just, you know, our normal conference season, conference speech. And it was only a day, our conference. It's normally like a four day sort of jamboree, but it was just one day, very serious. And this is where Tony made a fantastic speech. Those of you who are, you know, over 40 will remember it. He said, the kaleidoscope has been shaken. This is a moment to seize. Those were his words in that, in that conference. And I do remember that conference speech that he wrote without any difficulty at all. You know, normally there'd be a great sort of conference you know, nightmare of getting this speech out. But this, he did do this himself. And then I think we left the very next day on the big two last big trips that I was involved in. And the first one was we were going to Moscow, Islam, uh, Pakistan and India in order to see the lie of the land. Where were they on, or in all this and how, what, what would they support? Uh, an offensive against um, uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, the, the ultimatum, by the way, had been delivered by this time uh, to the uh, uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. And I, I, as I say, I can't remember the six points, but two of them were deliver him up and dismantle your, your camps. And we knew that they would never agree to that. Um, and then we went on this extraordinary trip and we had to take a VC-10, which is a very old dilapidated plane, because it had anti-missile devices on it. Um, and we flew into Moscow, meeting with Putin. Um, that's, that's your thing, Anthony, saying I have to finish soon. Yeah, you're um, doing fine. But I'm, very, I'm very nearly there. And I can remember in Moscow, his meeting with Putin, you know, all gone perfectly well. They did a... They did a, a, a um, a, a, a sort of joint press conference. And then that evening, Putin invited him out to his dacha. So Tony went off to his dacha 
And I, none of us went. He just went basically off on his own. I think one official. And he, they played snooker and drank quite a bit, I think. And I remember, I remember we getting a call from uh, Putin, uh, Tony rather, just saying, Putin thinks that we should set off tonight to go to Tajikistan and Turkmenistan and these all the other stands. He said, we, we, we need to get all their support. Let's just do a sort of quick trip around. And we said, no, thanks very much. No, we're not doing that. That's not on my agenda. And in the morning, got up, flew to Islamabad. And you, you forget, you know, how far it is from Moscow to Islamabad. It's a 10 hour flight. <laughs> and you literally, I remember I sat up with the pilot and he said, these are the stands. And it's 10 hours flying at you know, some speed of just des deserted land. And I just remember thinking, we're never going to find him because he could be anywhere in here. It's just the most enormous territory. Um, we arrived in Islamabad. I can remember we had to circle down. You know, it's a special thing that if there are fears of, of, of uh, 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 missile. missile hitting us, that they, they have to do a sort of descent in a certain way. And it was quite hairy. But I do remember, you know, and we all clapped when we landed, of course. And then we went to see President Musharraf to get his support. Tricky for him, you know, his borders, borders of Afghanistan. A lot of people would be coming there. In fact, a lot of Taliban did go and hide themselves in Pakistan, including, of course, uh, Azama, bin Laden himself. Um, big problems were obviously always there had been between Pakistan and in India. And I remember they, they, I think they deliberately were holding us back that evening. They were sort of eking out the dinner because they wanted to make us late for Vajpayee in India. Um, anyway, we got down to India. I remember great meetings with them, very supportive. Um, amazing press conference in the garden in, in, in the, in the uh, Indian residence. Um, we then, um, yeah, on the 7th of October, uh, that is when the first missiles were launched. Um, there'd been no, no um, um, obviously, word from, from the Taliban re giving up Osama bin Laden. Um, and there was uh, exocets were launched. That was, that was the beginning of the attack on Afghanistan. Uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, it, it was called. And it, I mean, it was a genuine coalition. You know, it was all the European countries were in it, you know, France, Spain, Italy, perhaps not with, with feet on the ground. Germans put in soldiers, but with intelligence, with special ops, um, New Zealand, Japan, Philippines. I mean, it's, it's, there were about 30 countries, Portugal, Poland. Um, that, and that was called Oper Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, we came back uh, uh, from that trip and then we went on another big trip. And this is where I'm going to end. Anthony, you'll be relieved to know. Um, we went, first of all, flew to Switzerland to a clinic in Switzerland because we had to meet um, Sheikh Zayed of, of the UAE because obviously we needed their support, which was f very much forthcoming. He was president of the UAE. And then we went on to Oman, Sultan of Oman. Obviously we needed his support and his ally support. And we had troops, of course, in Oman. And I can remember arriving then, this palace and this red carpet, and you know, this was the, sort of the full works and going out to visit the troops in the desert, staying in this sort of extraordinary place. And this sort of, I think it was like a 23 course banquet we had to attend that evening. And they got their guys to suddenly up on the balcony in this room, you know, one of their sort of, a group of their people just sort of started playing the bagpipes. <laughs> you know, they, they, they totally rolled out the red carpet, literally. There was Omanis in kilts. It was sort of ordinary. Um, the next day we went on to Cairo. Um, the next, then we went on to Assyria, the humiliation of Syria. Uh, we went to Amman in Jordan. We went to Israel, 
Tony was keen to get the whole Middle, Peace, Middle East peace process up and running again because he thought that, you know, that would be helpful in all our future dealings. I remember going on the, in, in the helicopter from Israel to Palestine. We went to see Arafat. And I remember just flying over, you know, talk about flying from the first world to the third world. And you sort of thought, you sort of get it a bit when you see it so starkly like that. Uh, and then I remember on that trip, we had to swing by a big dinner with Berlusconi on the way. We had to go to have dinner with him somewhere that night um so this was all media aftermath was this you know coalition building and then the um you know the the the, the war really in afghanistan that was the that was the next uh, step so um i'll leave it there i think you said 10 2 and i think i've arrived at that spot um perfect perfectly timed and uh, there are many there are over 3,000 people looking at this and and welcome to all of you um the size of uh, the Albert Hall if you imagine Angie that uh, you're talking to all of those and there are many students and one thing I'd pick out for students is notice that the personal in all of this we're talking about uh events uh, of massive global significance uh but there we have staff at the very heart worrying about their children uh, uh, and getting in touch with their husbands and wives and and notice also in what angie was saying the 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 the, the pettiness that can exist between the leaders the pakistanis wanting to make tony blair and the prime minister's team late uh, so that they arrive late for for india and and the playing of, of, of snooker it, it, it's that it's the sense of, of uh, that we can so easily lose that we're just dealing with with mortal human beings here with their own lives and, and concerns, even in the midst of, of these massive global events. Two, two things in particular before we come through to questions, Angie, and, and we've spoken often about over the years uh, about what happened on that day and thereafter. One is, you know, looking at Tony Blair talking to the TUC, I mean, what a supreme test that is for a prime minister's metal and self-command. One thinks of Thatcher in Brighton also just after the, the, the bomb attack that killed people uh, and uh, tried tried to kill her herself. Um, and uh, and the, the, the damage that that, 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 you know, that that did, but the strength that she showed, the strength he had then was just you know, formidable looking at it, many prime ministers would not have been able to have so much self-command. That strikes me. And also how strong he was compared to Bush. He seemed to know from the very moment uh, that it first happened, Tony Blair, what he wanted to do. And I've always thought that it was, uh, he was the strongest, short of Britain being the poodle to America. It was almost as if, um, I don't think you quite agree with that, but it, that's always been slightly the way that it looks. So um, let's come through uh, to questions of which there are an extraordinary number. Uh, and Chris, uh, who is a psychology student at Buckingham indeed, says he was watching it um, uh, on TV as the second airliner struck. And he's a pilot and he just said, I wonder, Angie, whether you had any thoughts about what might have been in the pilot's mind. I wonder if Chris means the, the pilot who was ejected from the cabin or the terrorist. Um, but I'll leave that with you. I would say, Chris, you're the expert on that particular subject. Um, you're the pilot. What do you think? You know, what do you think was going on in his mind? Uh, to, an uh, uh, to Anthony's point, you know, which pilot? Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a film called, oh God, is it, I, I, I'll, there is a film, feature film that was done. Was it Flight 136? It was the flight that, that was brought down on the, what was it? Flight 93, that's the one that was, um, uh, Absolutely. yeah, Flight 93. That was a green grass film, wasn't it, if I remember? Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's a really good film, and I, and I would recommend you do it so you can see what would be in the mind of the pilot there, I think. But I, look, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. I know what 
those poor passengers, what would be in their minds? Eh? Alan asks, um, how serious was the threat? Uh, was the, the Prime Minister taking of an attack on Britain? And were there fears about a plane going into Downing Street or into Parliament? How vulnerable indeed were they? Um, we, genu we didn't know, but you had to uh, assume that it was a possibility. And our, all our protection officers, you know, they, they all worked incredibly well to get us moving around without being spotted. Once you're in Downing Street, you're in Downing Street, that's pretty safe from attack. But no, I, I, I've spoken, I spoke to a lot of people. There were a lot of people, ordinary people, that thought were frightened that night, watching it all. And, now, and my daughter would said to me, you know, do you think we're going to get attacked? You know, it was on people's minds. Um, and, you know, our security guy, I remember Tony asking Stephen Lanza. Um, Who was, you know, was he's, MI5, was he? He was head of MI5, which is sort of homeland security. And poor Stephen, he must have, I asked him so many times, look, are you sure, you know, you know, is it going to happen here or not? Is it going to happen here or not? And Stephen said, you know, we were very reassured because they had clearly been monitoring suspicious people for a very long time. They had them, you know, under surveillance. So we were reassured that, that you know, as much as, could, as possible could be done. But look what they got through in the United States. That was the thing. Look what they managed to get past their security. Diana. Um, is asking, did you yourself see the intelligence reports and uh, to what extent uh, was there um, uh, premonitions or, or hard evidence that such an attack on the US was going to occur? Did it come out of the blue sky, literally and metaphorically? I, I'm not entirely certain, but I think it did. Um, there was not, prior to the attack, there was not fears that there wasn't a sort of heightened security. We hadn't been put on a different alert. Um, I, I cannot remember it, it being in our sort of, you know, on our sort of radar, um, as it were. But Tony had been, you know, increasingly concerned about, about the failed states and the people that were coming in and the possible use of weapons against us, chemical weapons, you know, we've been not monitoring Saddam for a long, long time. So, hey, I hope that answers your, your question. And um, a question here, um, how convinced was um, Tony Blair about what he was doing? Did that, and where does that certainty come from? It, it seems as if he had almost a Churchillian sense, the question is, uh, Churchill in 1940 saying that his life was a preparation for this hour. Um, in private, did Tony Blair have doubts about the coalition and going for? No, I never saw him doubtful at all. Um, not at all. Uh, he was it, 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 from when John Smith died. It's the same. He's got this sort of absolute certainty about certain things. And just like when John Smith died, he knew he should be the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, when this happened, he just rose to the occasion magnificently. I, I, I think he really reassured people. He, he, I never saw him waver. I remember that train journey coming back from Brighton. He was staring out the window and he has this look, you know, people that have worked with Tony and know him, where you you just know that he's sort of looking into the far distance. He sometimes does it un rather unnervingly when he's talking to you. Um, but you can see that the brain is, it's just going at 5,000 paces. Um, so, yeah, and then, you know, and, and he had a brilliant team of advisors. You know, these people from the Foreign Office, I mean, they, they were such high quality. Um, he had a brilliant new foreign policy advisor, David Manning. And he had John Soares. Um, uh, Richard Wilson was absolutely brilliant in all of this. I mean, they were, he, he, the quality of advice he was getting 
also strengthened him in his resolve. Um, he, and, uh, and, and just, just finally, there, there are quite a few questions, Angie's saying um, that, that people agreed more or less themselves about, uh, to different extent, some didn't about uh, going for Afghanistan and Tora Bora, the attack on trying to kill Osama bin Laden, um, but they didn't agree with Iraq. Um, but of course you weren't there, you left in late 2001, if I remember correctly, so you weren't around in the build up to Iraq, but do you have anything to say about, did 9-11 lead directly to the Iraq war? Is that your sense? I actually left on November the 8th, that same year. Really oddly, That's those nice. I was meant to, I was actually meant to be leaving on September the 12th. That was going to be the announcement of my departure. Because I'd been with Tony for 16 years and I'd got this fantastic job at BP. And, you know, and I was moving on. It was time for me to move on. So that, that was really my swan song. That And, and it was, you know, Tony took me on as an, I worked for him in 87. I said, what do you want me to do for you? I was, I was going in as a research assistant. He said, I want you to be my alliance builder, which I became for him, I think. And God, there was no greater alliance building than those last, that last month that I spent in Downing Street. I mean, that, you know, it was enormous. Anyway, sorry, I got slightly distracted there. Oh, Anthony, what? The, the question was about that did it lead inevitably to Iraq? Oh, uh, look, such difficult area for me. I, I think what it did do is, you know, we turned a blind eye to Saddam and various, uh, not a blind eye, but we, it, it, I think what 9 11 did, it just made you think these people have got to be dealt with. You know, they can't be allowed to carry on in this despotic, authoritarian way that causes such harm to their people. Um, which is what, as you know, that's what was happening in, uh, had happened in Kosovo, it happened in Iraq, uh, as Saddam had been doing that. So I think it, 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 it changed the parameters for us in a way that it, what was thought not possible before became possible because we did it with 9-11. You know, I, as, as Anthony very kindly said, you know, I'm, I, I don't like going into this territory because it's not, you know, I, I'm the same as you. You know, I've just read about it. I, I wasn't actually there, so it's hard for me to comment on. But that's what I think. I think it just shifted it in that regard. I mean, if you say to me, you know, what was the significance of 9-11? You know, I, it was, I don't think it was brilliant. I mean, what happened was, you know, bad things create bad things. And, um, you know, it tested the relationship between all the major powers in the world. It tested the UN, tested our European alliances, fractured some of them. Um, I think it destabilised the Middle East. This is not, you know, this was the 9-11 itself. Not necessarily, you know, what, what, what happens as a consequence of it. Um, and of course, it was a defining moment for Tony. And a defining moment for the Bush presidency and it was a defining moment for them personally and their reputation. I think that's that's a, a really excellent point to finish on that uh, this day 19 years ago um, everyone listening or 3,000 plus people will have different um, a different sense about what uh, what happened then and what uh, what happened following and, and the rightness or, or not of that and that's obviously right that everyone has their own views but what we've heard tonight is uh, a, a very clear insight into what it felt like to be close uh, while history was was happening um, uh, the the number 10 unit the British Prime Minister after Tony Blair, clearly the second most important power centre in the world. Uh, and there you were, Angie, right at the very eye of that storm happening. And you've given us um, with, with great care um, and trouble you put into that, your sense of what happened on that day for everyone then to make of that 
at what they will. And that's what universities are, are for, University of Buckingham, just to present uh, evidence uh, that, that you, br you brought that to life and, uh, uh, and shown the human dimension on that extraordinarily well and powerfully. And I know that everyone will want to uh, uh, show their gratitude in whatever way that they can um, online. Angie, thank you very, very much indeed. We pick up uh, on Monday with A.N. Wilson about uh, um, Charles Dickens, uh, one of the most controversial novelists uh, uh, in uh, of recent times, a very uh, controversial book by Wilson, Andrew Wilson about that. Do tune into that. And then we've got George Aligaya on Tuesday evening talking about his very moving uh, life and experience. Uh, Angie, from all of us, thank you very, very much indeed and have a good weekend, everybody.